shall we uh, start off again then? We're good to go. Right, I'd like to uh, introduce my uh, my colleague uh, Andy Payne uh, to talk about um, this project. I think it was a couple of years ago now, wasn't it? Or it was actually three? the winter of 2018. 2018. Yeah, so. So talk about um, this. I know um, on the screen it's a sort of a collaborative effort of the uh, the Historic England's geophysics team, but I'd just like to say thank you very much to Andy for volunteering to come along and talk about it, and I'll I'll leave it to you, Andy. So. Hi, well, welcome to to the talk on Velucio. Um I don't think there have actually been that many presentations about the results of this project. Um, so it's nice to get an opportunity to showcase some of the results we got um, to a local audience. Um, this really nice aerial photo here actually shows um, the village of Sandy Lane um, in the, uh, on the road between uh, Devizes and Chippenham in, in, west, in the western part, northwestern part of Wiltshire. Um, and um, this is basically the landscape um, where the small Roman town of Velucio is located. Um, and for, for those of you who aren't familiar with the site, um, Velucio is, is identified from its position in the Antonine itinerary with Sandy Lane, um, eight kilometers northwest of Devizes on the Roman road from Aquisulis to Cunetio, so that's Bath to Mildenhall. And um, there are plentiful finds of tesserae, pottery, coins, and brooches, and a density of stone material um, have been made over a large area, and several villas are known in the vicinity, um, one of which is actually in this photo, one of the villas. Um, so I'm just going to introduce you to a little bit more about Velucio and then then go on to talk about the work we've been doing in the environs um, around the site. Um, the site there's a um, the site is described in past scape um, as the the earthwork and crop mark, crop mark remains of an incomplete fortified enclosure with two rampart bank and two rampart banks have been identified from field work and aerial photographs uh, in relatively recent years, I think. And LIDAR images um, in the vicinity um, of, of the numerous Roman finds that have been, been known about for, for, for a much longer period of time. Um, and the, the best preserved earthworks survive within Hayfield Cops. Um, Here's the Roman road with the site located on it. And um, if you look at this slide, um, down at the bottom, I've got a red box. Um, which I'll just show you quickly. The spotlight thing. Um, and you, you can see the, the aerial evidence has been plotted on the, the OS mapping here, showing the outline of the, the enclosure, the defended settlement uh, with the line of the Roman road going from east to west through the middle of it um, and there's also some crop mark ev evidence at the southwest side of the, the enclosure too. Um, now what's what's really interesting is that Velucio is, is actually currently the only unscheduled fortified Roman town in, in southern Britain and you can see from this map that we've got a designated conservation area, Sandy Lane, to, to the um, to the west. The designated um, parkland parkland landscape of Spy Park, even further to the west, and a Roman villa at the top of the map, which is the Nut Hills Roman Villa. Which is all of these are designated um, on the heritage list for England, but Velucio itself is not currently designated. Um, mainly because we still really lack detailed evidence that would um, provide a sufficient understanding of the site to be able to, 
to des designate it. Um, what little we do know about the internal layout is, is based on a, a geophysical survey that um, fortunately was, was possible for Alistair Bartlett to do in 1995 um, for, for the Association of Roman Archaeology. I think um, the work was sponsored by Bryn Walters. Um, and we were we were lucky enough to get get hold of um, a basic plot of the the mag magnetometer data from the interior of Felucio, um, which does give us a bit of information on the in, the internal organisation of the site, um, which is quite interesting. Um, I think that looking at these these results, um, that they're not they're not immediately suggestive of a planned or formal urban layout, and are perhaps more what you would expect from a Roman station, which is a type of enclosed site site found at regular intervals along the course of Roman road routes. Um, and the Velucia results remind me of one of the Roman stations on Stane Street I have previously surveyed in West Sussex. Um, so there's, there's no evidence in the magnetometer data from Velucio for a formal, formal grid pattern of streets. And evidence for substantial buildings is, is sparse and limited to just a few possibilities located close to the perimeter of the defences. And if I can just get the pointer again, I'll just point a few of these out. Can you see to the to the left of the image against the circuit of the defences, we've got a possible series of buildings here, sort of right up against the edge of the enclosure. Um, and there may be some further buildings down here in the uh, southeast quadrant of the site. Um, it is it is, however, possible that structures may have been primarily of timber, with remains therefore less susceptible to detection by a, by a magnetometer. There are some internal rectilinear enclosures in the eastern portion of the site up here. Um, and also some relatively empty areas with only sparse activity within the western part of the settlement over here. Um, there also appears to be a a distribution of noisy magnetic activity in the center where I'm sort of hovering the pointer at the moment bisected by a road corridor um, running diagonally through the center of the enclosure on a south southeast to north northwest alignment and intersecting with the line of the main um, Roman road which can be seen in the magnetometer data as, ex as expected, running east-west through the middle of the enclosure. The secondary road appears to curve to the northwest as it exit, exit, exits the settlement to the north. Um, and, the, and finally, the outline of the defensive circuit is also visible in the form of parallel lines uh, describing an apo approximate square shape with the preserved earthwork bits in the copse in this missing bit up at the northwest um, and the rest visible as, as, as parallel lines of positive magnetic anomalies with the um, typical curvilinear corners of a Roman defended enclosure. So that's sort of the um, state of play with what we know about Volucchio really and you, you know we, we have been able to interpret a reasonable amount from from the limited geophysics that, that was done back in the 90s. Um, so um, moving on from the actual town in inverted commas itself, um, interest in further interest in, in Velikia was was kindled by the um, National Archaeological Identification Survey in West Wiltshire, which was undertaken uh, during 
2013 to 2015 and and published in 2016 and um, this was a a multidisciplinary integrated landscape survey project that was um, largely based initially on extensive um, mapping of the aerial photographic evidence in the um, in the grey area here on this map on the left hand side um, and you can see a, a more detailed um, zoomed in view of that area um, that Velucchio has actually included in, a, in an extension of this mapping area to the east um, but it was decided because of the great density of uh, information discovered in the, across the whole of the, the NAIS project area um, which is shown here to actually um, focus on Velucchio as a separate project as a, as a, as a follow-up to the archaeological investigations that were done as part of the main West Wiltshire NAIS. Um, so once the once the main survey project was concluded in 2016, um, a new phase of archaeological investigation was then planned for the Velucchio environs starting in 2018. And um, you can see here as here's a, a zoomed in view of the aerial evidence from the main um, NIAS with Velucchio shown quite clearly just to the right of center with the um, line of the Roman road quite prominent as well um, and you can see that in the environs of Velucchio there's a considerable amount of activity um, that's been been picked up um, from the aerial archaeology stage of the NAIS project and using this we we um, then attempt to design a program of um, follow-up um, follow-up survey of some of the interesting sites that are shown in the landscape around Velucchio. Um, the initial plan was to just um, look at an area immediately adjacent to the town and following the line of the Roman road um, coming in approaching the the site of the town from the east um, but unfortunately we due to a combination of difficulties over land access um, and um, landowners that were not um, very enthusiastic about allowing access uh, we then uh, had to change our priorities to look slightly wider wider out into the landscape um and uh yeah this is what this is what we resulted this is what this is uh what what that sort of exercise resulted in and um you can see that the um the shaded gray areas um one one area to the to the south of the roman town and another area to the north of the roman town are, are where we actually focused our our geophysical investigations um, but you can also see from the wider map that there's um, other areas where, where the aerial photographic evidence is also uh, uh, marked on the mapping, um, which enables us to sort of see the, the areas that we were able to do the geophysics on in a sort of wider landscape context as well. And in some cases, we were able to relate what we got in the the geophysics to the wider wider aerial aerial archaeology evidence um, so all of this surveying was done over a period of three weeks in the winter of 2018 um, we used two techniques um, The first consisting of um, a toad array of um, six geometrics G862 cesium vapor magnetometer sensors 
on a non-magnetic sledge with a, a central gradient sensor one meter above the array and um, sample density of around 0.15 meters by 0.5 meters and using GPS for positional control. So essentially we've got a very rap system capable of very rapidly covering large areas with very high sample density, you know, with, with very high resolution data. Um, and we also used a 3D radar mark for geoscope continuous wave step, step frequency GPR system um, with a multi-element DGX 1820 um, uh, antenna. Um, and this, this is also a um, multi-sensor array, to toad instrument array, and gives us an incredibly detailed sample density of 0 0.075 meters by 0 0.075 meters. So 75 centimeter intervals, um, and also um, using GPS for positional control. So those, those two techniques in combination, you know, give us a great deal of information uh, complementary information compared to just relying on a single single technique um, and we're both both of them are able to cover sort of large areas in relatively short periods of time but having said that because we were surveying partly during the period of the beast from the east if anybody remembers that um, we had some in interesting weather to contend with and site conditions including deep ground ruts, um, snow and ice, surface waterlogging and maize crops over most of the fields that left very um, tough stalks of maize stubble which played havoc on occasion with some of the equipment. So now quickly on to the results. Um, here are uh, um, the overall magnetometer results from the area one, which is to the south of Velucchio, um, with uh, Bromham House Farm just, just to the south. Um, and um, you can see we've picked up a sort of multi-period landscape of including a, an Iron Age oval enclosure, um, Bronze Age round barrows, a series of trackways that appear to, to sort of focus on the Iron Age enclosure. And then a period of very dense uh, activity um, up in the northwest e extremity of the survey, which is only about one field to the south, about 200, met 200 meters or so, 300 meters to the south of the boundary of Roman Velucchio. So we think this um, intense activity up in that area is possibly actually um, associated with the town and you know activity immediately outside the walls of the, the Roman town and um, this little um, plan just just summarizes all of that information um, and there's quite a lot of feet quite a lot of um, information there but that we would love to get some kind of chronological framework for, um, such as the relationship between the trackways and the actual Iron Age enclosure. Um, we also appear to have evidence of some industrial activity up in Area D near the Roman town and also along the track at various points along the trackways. Um, and you can see an interesting, interesting uh, fork in in the trackway as it as it runs to the away to the um, the east from the Iron Age settlement. The trackway appears to to bifurcate into two separate uh, strands, and also the the response to the trackways reduces in the magnetometer data the further away you get from the main settlement focus. And we think the Iron Age settlement is probably similar to various other Iron Age enclosure sites in um, 
Wessex, some of which were identified in the larger NAIS West Wiltshire project, including um, a site at Paxcroft on the outskirts of Trowbridge, um, which was partially excavated um, and found to have originated in the early Iron Age. And there are other parallel sites as well, like Meon Hill in, um, uh, in Hampshire that sort of fit into this type of site. They don't appear to have dense internal occupation, although there are some, is some evidence of um, single circular roundhouse in the enclosure at Paxcroft. This is the um, nearly earlier geophysical survey site at Paxcroft undertaken um, for, for the, the, West, the earlier West Wiltshire NAIS project. Um, after the initial phase of survey at Bromham, we then switched our attention to um, the site of the Bromham Roman Villa, um, which is um, adjacent to the, um, the main road from Devizes to Chippenham. Um, The, the general site of the villa is, is known, um, but uh, the actual precise location of the, the villa buildings itself has been lost. Um, and what you can see in these uh, magnetometer results is that um, they reveal a typical villa landscape with a network of rectilinear enclosures and trackways. But within this data, there's no real obvious evidence of villa buildings. Um, and you can see, you can see the interpretation of that, that magnetometer data. But what's, what's quite interesting here is you can see that there's, um, the trend of all the enclosures and field systems related to this villa, um, appears on a different alignment to the Roman activity that's located further to the north, nearer to the Roman town of um, Verlucio. So up here, you can see there's rectilinear enclosures that certainly appear to be Roman in character. Um, but somewhere in this blank spot, which we were this empty area that we were unable to get access to, the whole alignment of the um, Roman partition of the landscape obviously changes radically in, in, in orientation. So it would be really interesting to have been able to see how that all links together. Um, so having, having not really managed to locate the villa convincingly, convincingly with um, magnetometry, um, my colleague Neil um, extended the GPR survey that we'd, we'd um, done earlier at, at the site of the north uh, in the hope of detecting some, some remains of buildings and actually even extended into the, the, the paddocks um, to the immediate south of the modern houses. Um, so here we, here we have the, the GPR data over the same area at Bromham Villa. And you can see we've got low reflector anomalies that um, indicate ditches which, which tie in very well with the responses to ditches in the magnetic data. Um, but unfortunately, there's still no obvious evidence of the villa buildings, uh, which you might expect to have a better chance of being able to pick up with the, the GPR. Um, and so, so, so we're left, we're left, um, thinking that the, the villa buildings, if, if they may have actually been, um, built over by the, by the, the group of houses or may actually lie under, lie under the main road immediately to the, uh, west. Um, but, you know. I think there's definitely a Roman villa here because we've got this really convincing landscape of enclosures and driveways. 
and field systems that looks very villa-like in character. So quickly moving on to the second site, which is potentially even more interesting. Um, this is um, a site that's a series of sites actually that also initially detected by aerial photography, but the the Roman villa element at Nut Hills um, is, also, is also scheduled and has been known about uh, for a considerable time due to um, surface finds. Um, so this is actually the, the one designated site we looked at. Um, but it's, it's, it's an old county number scheduling, which basically means that it was scheduled a long time ago and the scheduling information is very basic and therefore the site's very, still very poorly understood. Um, you can see here that, um, just go back to the previous slide, also to the, to the east of the villa, we have this really interesting square enclosure, double ditch square enclosure, which is bisected by a belt of, of woodland. Um, and it's, if anybody knows the village of Sandy Lane, it's, it's located just around the back of the George, I think now defunct George Inn. Um, so the aim was to actually investigate both of these, these sites um, that are in close proximity. And you can see here the, the, aerial, the aerial evidence for the square enclosure with, um, with Sandy Lane just, just to the south. So here we have the, um, again, very nice magnetometer data. Um, the geology here is absolutely perfect um, for getting good magnetometer results, especially the area of the Nut Hills Villa, which is on Corallian limestone deposits, which is, you know, sort of the, the ideal, the ideal really for, for, for mag survey. Um, and you can see the evidence in both cases um, has, has with, with, with the surveys have, have um, come up with some, some really clear, clear results. Um, and these are how we've interpreted the results. Um, I'll start with square enclosure. Um, the results indicate that the internal and outer ditch is not quite parallel or square and there is a relative absence of internal activity, activity compared to the exterior to the east. Um, there's also evidence of a single large internal pit near the northeast corner of the inner enclosure. And the site is, is partially disturbed by later quarrying and has an entrance in the eastern side. Um, from, from what we've, um, from results we've got, we, we, we think the site possibly represents an Iron Age or, or Roman or both ritual enclosure. And um, my, my colleague, who's uh, Mark Bowden, has, has carried out a, 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 an investigation of the earthwork evidence and the LIDAR evidence. And he's, um, in his report, he's analysed and interpreted the actual significance of the site in a bit more detail. Um, moving on to the, the Nut Hills Villa. Um, I mean, this is this is really fascinating because the magnetometer data has revealed a considerable amount more than what the um, the evidence visible in the aerial aerial evidence, and we've got a polygonal system of ditched enclosures surrounding an inner inner pair of ban banjo enclosures with entrance corridors extending to the east. Um, there is evidence of heavily fired features within the enclosure complex and, and further to the west. 
um, together with suggestions in places of masonry building remains indicated by groups of negative linear magnetic anomalies, which seem to be focused on the wide ditched oval ban banjo enclosure. So um, in the magnetic data, we were, we were getting sort of fragments of, of possible buildings showing up, just hints, hints of potential building remains. And this is, this is where the ground penetrating radar survey that Neil Linford undertook really came into its own. Um, that's just to sort of give you this comparable sc scale to the, uh, the magnetometer data, but I'll just zoom in and you can see um, it looks like there's probably a second phase of Roman um, Roman buildings um, that have been constructed over the earlier Iron Age um, enclosure remains, which only really start start appearing in the, in the G GPR data in in the sort of detail that um, detail that we would want in order to understand the, the significance of the structures. So I think I think um, there's probably at least six individual structures. Um, on varying orientations focused on and overlying the earlier wide ditched banjo enclosure. And th this is just one time slice. So th this is the, the time slice that sort of provides the, um, the uh, best, one of the best uh, images of the, the building structures. I'll just go back to the previous slide because that's Time slice depth is 0.98 to 1.14 meters below the surface. Um, so you'll see that from this image, much structural detail is apparent in the data showing both the elaborate plan of some of the buildings and also evidence of deep foundations in places suggestive of substantial structures and good archeological survival. Um, I'm glossing over the GPR evidence slightly because there's there's so much to include in the talk. I've got to sort of just keep it to the edited highlights really, but the GPR data could easily be just fire talk talk by itself. It's fascinating. Um, so resulting from all of that work at Nut Hills, we've uh, this, this image here, um, I think it's this slide slightly formatted wrong, so it's squashed it up horizontally a bit, but you'll get the idea. Uh, this is a combined image of the interpretation of the magnetometer data, which is primarily showing the ditched enclosures, and the GPR data, which is primarily giving us really good image, images of the, 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 the building complex. Um, and with all of that overall evidence combined, um, we think, um, well, based on looking at those buildings, they don't really look typically villa-like at all um, because of the fact the buildings are of many different shapes and sizes and on many different orientations. And it appears to be, uh, it's, it sort of resembles more, more of a, a sort of temple complex similar to uh, one example is Lydney in Gloucestershire. So we think we may have located a, identified a, you know, a, a Roman temple complex rather than a, rather than a sort of more typical villa, uh, which has um, its origins in the Iron Age and continued to be a significant um, out of town religious complex in the Iron Age because it appears to be on a road system linking into other roads in the landscape visible and aerial photography that um, are linked to the Roman town to the, to the, just to the south. So last slide I think nearly, um, hope I haven't overrun. Um, the some overall conclusions, um, the, the geologies of the local area all proved very conducive to geophysical survey both magnetometry and GPR. Using the two complementary techniques was particularly useful. Um, and following the results, we are now beginning to piece together a map of the Roman and, and earlier 
exploitation of Felucchio's environs. Um, but there is also rich potential for further geophysical survey here and also follow-up investigation of the existing geophysics undertaken so far. The one disappointment was that it was not possible for, for the originally proposed follow-up excavation stage to go ahead after the landowners got jittery. Perhaps we just found too much. This must have been a, a very frustrating process for the HE archaeological investigation team. Um, just to say that a few of a few other groups have undertaken additional follow-up work or or previously to our geophysics. Um, David Saban and Kerry Donaldson undertook some geophysics just to the um, east of Felucchio, and you can see the Roman road approaching the site from the east in the top part of this magnetometer uh, plan. Uh, again, it, it just shows how well suited the area is to, to further survey. Um, and I'll, to finish, just a few quick, uh, just a quick slide of a few of the reports that are available on the project, which can be downloaded. Uh, from the Historic England website, and the the, um, the link is below in that slide. So um, thank you for thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Andy. That was really really interesting. Uh, huge amounts of work, and fantastic, some amazing results from the geophysics. Um, David, do we have uh, any questions? We Andy. do. Um, we've got uh, from Pam Thomas. She says that the villa is supposed to extend under the road and on the other side. The mosaic floor was discovered under an orchard in the 1960s. I'm not sure if you knew about that or if... That... Yeah, we were wondering that. That was one of the questions we had. Um, we did look at some of the land across the road and it appears to have had a lot of um, clutter, sort of modern... Um, stuff uh, spreading over it now which ma made it quite difficult potentially to extend the survey um, but we were also we, we actually got to the stage where the the, the landowners were also um, not happy for us to extend any further um, in the areas that we'd already done to the west of the road as well it just sort of got cold feet really um so there were there were other areas where you can see the enclosure complex extending into already which um you know also could be potential candidates so the villa the villa's there somewhere it's just we haven't managed to pin it down quite yet okay. next one is from wendy crammond she, she says she's puzzled as to why the Roman road comes into Velucco from the east and doesn't track straight through, but uh, heads up north and does the dog leg. It's got this really curious dog leg, yeah. Um, I suspect there may be a topographical um, aspect to it. Um, I'm sure somebody's already answered this question, but... I don't really know the answer, but I'm sure somebody must have thought about that and actually come to some conclusion as to why it does that. I mean, it goes, it goes, it sort of basically does this almost, it does a very acute turn and then sort of then after Sandy Lane then reacquires its its nice straight course. Um, but there is, there is a funny little topographical kink it where it goes through a river valley in um, Spy Park as well, where it does a little sort of V shape, um, which is definitely a topographical sort of um, detour, I think. It's, it's moving out the contours. Yeah. Yeah, so you yeah. don't have to go up and down too steep a slope. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Carlos and Janine um, have answered, asked two questions, being greedy. <laughs> Um, results show the town may extend beyond the boundaries. Uh, I assume that's beyond the defences. Yeah, does absolutely. That suggest about the longevity of its occupation compared to similar station sites along Roman roads. I suspect it's probably got quite a longevity of occupation, given the large density and and also extent of the 
activity surrounding the town. But we, I mean, I think the only dating evidence we've really got is probably from the villas, and even that's quite limited. Um, and also, you know, the pottery and surface material that's recorded from the town itself. So, I mean, there, re there really is a need for a, you know, proper program of excavation based research to try and fit some chronological framework to all of these, all of this interesting survey evidence. Um, Mike Gill has asked whether, um, said that a sledge was used for the magnetometry. Is yeah. Why a sledge, not a wheeled cart? Um, good question. Um, we, we just find a sledge is, is more flexible, really. Um, most of the time it does stay in a pretty straight line and it's, it's therefore a little bit more durable and particularly when you're going over quite rough, rough terrain. Um, and it's also potentially got less magnetic parts in it as well um, to interfere with the, you know, the, the, the magnetic sensors. Um, so wheeled carts tend to be more common, uh, um, more commonly used as in these, these towed systems. Um, but, but the, a, a sledge based system is just a, is just an alternative that we, we happen to find sort of suits us quite well. It also fits together very quickly and disassembles very quickly. The only problem we really had with it on one of the sites at um, Bromham House Farm was the ground was very, very wet and waterlogged and very large tractors had gone in the fields doing muck spreading. And they're the, they're the sort of giant massy Ferguson tractors that have such big wheels that they, they produce ruts about a foot across and about a foot deep. So the, on occasion, the, the sledge would just sort of settle into some of those ruts. And if the ruts weren't parallel with the direction we were trying to go with the, the traverses, the sledge just wouldn't, wouldn't pop out of these ruts. It was, it was almost like a bobsleigh run. <laughs> and, um, on occasion, you know, we, we risked actually flipping over the whole sledge once it was stuck in one of these ruts and it would only go in the direction of the rut and would not be persuaded to go in any other direction that we wanted it to. <laughs> okay. Jane, but I don't think a wheeled system would have worked either on that terrain, to be honest. It doesn't sound like it, especially with the, uh, the slug, slurry. It must be yeah. delightful. Um, Jane Hanbidge has said, and I hope I've pronounced this right, Professor Oosterhausen suggests that uh, large rectangular Iron Age enclosures were for cattle rather than ritual. Any thoughts? I mean, that's, that's certainly a, a quite a, a good alternative explanation for it because it, as, as you will have noticed, it, it doesn't really appear to have much internal activity in it. So um, it's one of these sites, you, given the lack of, obvious internal activity could quite easily be a cattle enclosure. Do I remember um, there's, a, there's another one immediately north as well? There are quite a few others, it's, uh, sort of slightly smaller, um, there are several um, different square or rectangular enclosures. Um, just... Uh, so quick look. Um, I'll just go back to the overall aerial evidence, here we go. Um, just get the... Um, okay. Um, just get the annotation thing again. Yeah, there's one up here. Uh, which is the one that we've surveyed. Uh, then there's a smaller one just to the immediate south of the Nut Hills Villa, which is in here. Between Velucchio and, and the Nut Hills Villa. And then there's a, another one, smaller one over here, just to the north of the Roman Road and just to the northeast of Velucchio. 
So there's, there's quite a few interesting rectilinear enclosures. Um, Melanie Pomeroy Kellinger pointed out that the kinky robe thing, as she puts it, uh, was also present at the new town discovered at Beanacre that she talked about last week. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and she's also said, is there any chance Historic England will be able to try again and get permission to excavate in this area? Is it be good to get the town scheduled and excavation evidence? I, I, really, I really hope so. And obviously my colleagues that were involved in that, that, um, side of things we're obviously very disappointed and i'm sure they're not gonna you know they'll probably want to persevere at, at some point and try and um, have another another attempt carlos and janine sort of asked the sort of the same question but also asked about the ritual site i, I guess the answer is the same yeah it's really you know just a single large pit in there and relatively empty of activity um and it's also possible it's a funerary site um, yeah, may have may have had burials in it, which may not necessarily be detectable with the uh, the magnetometer. There so are, um, there are burials to the east, aren't there? For the east yeah, of the yeah, so, yeah. Um, and Chris Sellen has said, has any size comparison been done on the Roman enclosed structure to compare with other towns like Cunetio? Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that, but. It would be certainly worth doing if it hasn't been, um, because I think we have we have good evidence, don't we, from Cunetia? I think there's uh, particularly I think the Time Team did did a big campaign of geophysics there, sort of about ten years ago. Something I was going to ask, well, sort of, sort of ask ask you to reflect on, because you said that at Valucio there's sort of very little, not much evidence to buildings within within the town. Of course, yeah. That was the same that the um, the time team survey found. Um, so the Mencio was came out brilliantly, but there was the rest of yeah. it would be pretty empty. So it was really just maybe one one group of si significant buildings in the whole enclosure. Home buildings and, and everything else. Yeah. And timber. So the Lucio, yeah, would would match up really well with that mm -hmm. from what from what we can see. Yeah. I mean, if if you're expecting a Roman small town like Caesta by Norwich a little sort of square Roman town with a lovely system of streets in it. It's not going <laughs> to, it, yeah, it, does, it doesn't, doesn't match up to that. Okay. That's it for the questions on the chat, on the, um, on the Q and A at the moment. Does anyone else have any, any questions? Uh, David Ryder's raised his hand. David. Ah, right. Okay. So I, I just can you uh, can I do that? Oops. I can allow him to talk. Is that okay? if you, yeah, if you can. David, if you could unmute. There you go. Yeah, done that. Um my <coughs> spelling's no good, so I wasn't going to type a question out. Could the lack of um buildings in Valucchio itself be due to all the villas around and there's no townhouses all you've got in the in the town is just industrial and inns and taverns and sort of mercantile activity yeah it could it could also be that there's like an official function as well to the to the site uh, and that you know um if it's got a sort of military or administrative function, you know, it might be a bit more like a Roman fort with a, with a vicus outside it, in that the the civilian settlement was actually delibor deliberately shunted, shunted away from the the official part of the, you know, the enclosure, so that there would have been sort of only official buildings in there, if you like. But also, I think you, what what you said about indus industrial activity is interesting as well because there's. Uh, Grinsall um, in his book on the archaeology of Wessex uh, back in published back in 1955 refers to uh, a lot of evidence in, in the landscape some of which may be reflected in the geophysics for iron production 
and there could have been an industrial element going on there too which obviously you don't want lots of buildings around particularly timber buildings if there's industrial um activity going on there was an awful lot of um lead has come up from um metal detecting survey across the town itself yeah i've just yeah. i've just sort of put two and two together that could well be imply um timber structures so the, the iron working evidence is all a bit anecdotal um, um but you do you do hear it referred to in various sources at Cunetio as well, it was suggested that um, the defences may have been to raise tax as as, um, uh, as trading goods came into and out of... So uh, an, in an enclosure like a customs post where they could nab you. Yeah, so it's as much yeah. warehousing as yeah. somewhere for people to live. David, um, Pam um, Thomas has just made a comment about the, the iron working in the area, saying that the spy park is a lot of ironstone, mm -hmm. which is just lying on the ground in a field in Brom is called Cinder Barrows and was stuffed full of Roman slag. Yeah, oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, to what extent that's all connected with the Luke area is still, still a bit uncertain, but it's, yeah, there's certainly evidence that there was iron working going on in the Roman period, probably contemporary with with the site at Velikia. Lovely. Any more questions, David? Um, I think that's it. Unless there's anyone else? You can put, put your hand up if you want to actively ask a question. Oh, no, I think... Melanie. Melanie has. Let me just allow to talk. I think Melanie, you can unmute now. There you go. Now you have the power, Dan. <laughs> um, I, was just going to, I was just going to say, of course, that Mother Anthony's well isn't that far away. So I'm just going to close the kitchen door. It's not far away at all. Yeah, it's very close. Uh, Mother Anthony's well and the Roman remains found there really isn't that far away. Yeah. It'd be really good to look at the relationship and the chronologies and similarities, etc. I mean, they were a bit more geophysics. They could almost link up with the work done at um, at Bromham House Farm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and Pam Thomas has uh, said that Wessex archaeology found a possible iron working furnace in the centre of Bromham Village. Really? Yeah. Unfortunately, the, the geophysics was only the first stage of what was supposed to be a much more extensive project. Um, so, so at the moment, we've only got geophysical reports that are published, plus the original PD for the the overarching project. Um, so I think had the project sort of continued in the more ambitious way it was originally proposed, there, there would be a sort of more uh would be a fuller sort of publication um on the whole sort of Vilukia environs but at the moment we're just stuck with the geophysics stage without without really the follow-up stuff um it was so disappointing the change in uh the the, the decision of landowners not to allow excavation to proceed yeah I think we, we were to some extent quite lucky to even, even be able to do the geophysics because um, I think they were willing to, to tolerate a small team of geophysicists, but maybe not a, a larger team um, with all of the logistical, you know, site huts and all of that kind of stuff that would be involved with, with a, a full full excavation, which was a shame, real pity. Yeah. But, you know, hopefully in the future, I would just quickly like to say as well, I'd just like to thank all of the other hist historic England colleagues that have been and contributed to um, the Veluca environs um, study. Um, both both my geophysical team colleagues, um, Paul, and, Paul and Neil Linford, but also the aerial archaeology teams, the, the team that are based in Swindon, so Helen Winton and her colleagues, uh, Jonathan Last, who and David Roberts, who um, were instrumental in sort of putting together the original plans to 
so they do the do the project on Baluku. And I hope I've not missed anybody out. Oh yeah, also Mark Bowden as well, who did a really interesting survey of the square enclosure. And, and just to add, to, to be selfish, the, um, the the team came and went through all the finds we got in the museum and metal um, metal detecting finds in the museum that we've uh, that, that have been collected over the years. So you know, it really was a soup to nuts assessment, an exemplary piece of work. Brilliant. Well, David, I think, uh, Andy, I think we should probably um, bring it to a to a close tonight. If there's no other questions, David, nothing else. Um, I'd like to say really thank you very much, Andy. Um, really good to see you. Anytime. Thank you for the talk. Um, and yeah, and please, you know, anytime um, Historic England want to carry on doing some nice geophysics work in, in Wiltshire, just carry on. <laughs> it's always good to see, uh, see the results of some of the projects. That's uh, fantastic. I mean the the off chalk areas in the, in West Wiltshire are so, are so are so perfect for for archaeological geophysics. As also as you know, work that David Sabin and and Kerry are also doing. So sites like Beanacre that um, Melanie showed us um, last week. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, let's draw that to a close. Um, we're back to, tomorrow evening um, with uh, David Thomas, who, who Andy mentioned, uh, David Thomas, David Roberts, uh, who Andy uh, mentioned earlier. Um, and he's been talking about not a historic England project, nor a, a University of Cardiff project that he's actually uh, at at the moment, but a, a, another project he has um, on Tefont down in the, the south of the county. So uh, thanks again, Andy. Thank you, everyone. And um, we'll see people um, tomorrow. Yeah. And there's a round of virtual applause breaking out on the uh, on chat. So thank okay. you, Andy. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.